Hello, BookTube. Well, uh, it's Friday, and it's been a rough week, and there's a rainstorm coming tomorrow. Uh, so I went to the Brattle Bookshop. It's a used bookstore in downtown Boston. It's crammed full of books, and I kind of sort of hinted that I wouldn't be going there for quite some time, because last week, just a few days ago, I wrapped up a week in which I got well over 100 books. Uh, but I was in the neighborhood anyway, and I was going to stop in just to make a social call, and it would have been rude not to buy something. <laughs> so I went to the Brattle and shopped to my heart's content. And as a result, I have a stack of books to show you. I found some weird things, some interesting things. I left behind some things. That's that something I try not to do anymore. Just get everything that tracks your eye the one time you're there, and then, you know, let God sort it out. It'll all come out in the wash months from now. And I didn't do that this morning. I think in part because I was overestimating how horrible it would be to get it all back here, since I didn't have a car, I didn't have David Murphy anymore, I would have to lug it myself. I think I overestimated that, the terror of that, and that's what caused me to leave some things behind. I'm certainly not going there tomorrow, because it's going to be raining tomorrow. Uh, and then not open on Sunday. So it'll be next week before I go back. But I did go, and I did get some things that are worth showing to you. Uh, the first one is a hardcover science fiction volume. There's a lot of hardcover science fiction out in the uh, in the sale lot. The Brattle is a used bookstore, and they're great. They're a fantastic used bookstore on their own. Lots and lots of overturn. Uh, but they also have a sale lot right next door to the shop with $1, $3, and $5 books. And it's not just a wheelbarrow of them like you would get outside a normal used bookstore. It's a gigantic floor plan of a store. It's just thousands of books. Uh, it was pretty cold first thing this morning, uh, pretty inhospitably cold. We're right on the doorway of that simply not being true anymore for 10 months. But it was still persistently cold this morning. But even though I noticed there were quite a few hardcover science fiction titles out there in the lot. Uh, I don't know why that is, and I also don't know, I can, I'm never 100% sure, unless it says so on the spine, whether or not these things are science fiction book club editions. Uh, like this thing, for instance, this is uh, The Dark Between the Stars by Paul Anderson, uh, with an, a very science fiction-y Adam and Eve cover there. Uh, this is a collection of short stories. Oh, sorry, I'm blocking the bean. <laughs> I don't want to do that. Do I? Uh, this is a collection of short stories, and I've never seen this hardcover before, so I, I grabbed it. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't have anything like this on it. It says Berkeley, but I wonder if this isn't a science fiction book club edition. This has, uh, since you science fiction fans of a certain vintage might be interested, uh, let's see here. This anthology came out in 1981, and it includes The Sharing of Flesh, Fortune Hunter, Utopia, The Pugilist, Night Peace, The Vore Trekkers, Gibraltar Falls, Windmill, and Call Me Joe. And I think I've read probably two of those. So uh, not not my favorite science fiction author, but I do seem to be finding his books. Uh, then, oh my, what a find. I have used a copy of this thing until it was ready to fall apart at the old, old private library where I use this thing every single day. I honestly was to the point where I was thinking, well, you know, in good conscience, I should simply order, I should offer to buy a new copy. For the library. I'm using this so much. Never thought I would find it out in the wilderness. This is uh, by Avril Cameron, and it is her study of Procopius. Uh, part of a series. This, this uh, We've seen this, this series before, and uh, with other authors. Never thought I would see this. Just wonderful. This is from like uh, 40 years ago, something like that. Uh, 1985, yeah, 40 years ago. Uh, and it's a study of this great historian that whose works I came to know intimately well. I have I have a work. Ordinarily I like to get to get in and out. Nobody gets hurt with my writing. I'm very deadline oriented. I'm very the end oriented. There's one thing in my entire writing life that has defied that pattern. And it is a novel about the uh, the Roman general Belisarius and his emperor, Justinian, and his wife, and the emperor's wife. Uh, it's called Belisarius Out in the Dark Running. And I have gone back and back and back to that book. That is my King Arthur book. I've gone back and back and back to that book more times than I can count. And 
I've used this book a lot when I've done that. A lot. I mean, this is a serious study of Procopius in which this author, she, she tries to figure out, tries to reconcile uh, the literary remains of this author. Uh, Procopius wrote uh, a lot, first of all, but one of the things he wrote was an official account of Justinian's massive building program in Rome and elsewhere. Uh, that is, it's it, no pun intended, very monumental. It reflects very well on the state. It's uh, it's very reverential. It very detailed, very sober and serious. There was also there were also tributes to uh, Justinian that read the same way. But then, uh, centuries and centuries later, in the seventeenth century, it came to light that Procopius had also written another book. That he'd written the book that now he is infinitely more famous for, the Secret History which is not anything like the buildings or the, any of the panegyrics. It's, it's not anything like them at all. It's wonderful. First of all, it's wonderful reading. Oh my God, find a Penguin classic of the secret history and read it. You're going to love it. Uh, but it's scandalous. It's gossipy. It's savage towards Justinian and Theodora and, and Belisarius and his wife and everybody else at court. And there've been, you know, in the centuries since then, there've been scholarly classic, uh, classical scholars who said, there's no way the same person wrote these books and who've raised a cloud of very interesting questions about the provenance of the secret history. And Avril Cameron makes the point in this book that they are, it's that they are not only written by the same person, but obviously by the same person. And I argued with this book as much as I loved it. I argued with it constantly, especially uh, there are a lot of points that, that Cameron makes about Christianity. Uh, that I'm not sure I'm on board with, even after all this time of thinking about it. But I, it is going to be, it's an absolute delight to have this thing, <laughs> to have this, because, of course, I'm not done with that Belisarius book. <laughs> I don't know that I ever will be done with that Belisarius book. So it's good to have this, definitely. Uh, then we have a trade paperback of uh, A.H. Farrar Hockley's uh, The Psalm. I have this as a UK mass market paperback, uh, that really, I've gone to it a few times because, I, especially just recently, because I just got last week a big book on the psalm, uh, and I don't trust that mass market to live. I, I really don't. I didn't know this existed as a trade paperback, but this is infinitely more durable than the mass market that I have, and this is a classic study. It's, it's something I definitely want. I, I actually, it sprang immediately to mind when I got that big fat psalm book by Philpot last week. I thought, you know, oh, I wish I'd looked for the Hockley book on the Psalm in a more durable edition than the one I have. Well, I found one today, so uh, so I grabbed it. Uh, then I mentioned I mentioned last week when David was here that the Brattle bought a gigantic library of those big Avenal omnibus editions uh, that uh, that I tend to like so much. I got a bunch of them last week because I had a car. They're big and heavy books. I knew there'd be some left over. Today, the Brattle sale lot, they're all out in the sale lot, and the Brattle sale lot gets picked over like you wouldn't believe. If there's a beautiful weekend, you can see several hundred people go through that lot. So I wasn't expecting to find many of them, but I found one that I actually do want. I found an omnibus of James Up Kane. Uh, this has the postman always doing strikes, Mildred Pierce, double indemnity, and serenade. I have double indemnity uh, as a, a lovely little trade paperback a standalone trade paperback. And I believe one of those is in the Library of America crime volume box set. I'm drawing a blank right now on which one. I know that Kane must be in there. I, I, I'm drawing a blank right now on which one it is. Uh, and it's not anywhere near me. That's, I have that set. I don't keep a lot of Library of America volumes, but I kept that one. But to have all these in one book like this and with this, you know, the seamy cover, definitely. So that'll go on the, the, the shelf with all the other omnibus editions that I've been finding. Uh, then these next two are the result of bullying, because when David Murphy was here last week, he was we were re rearranging my books, and one of the things we rearranged was a history section. Spent a lot of time moving all the history books and getting them all together. It turns out a little fruitlessly, uh, because we, we put them in a bookcase that we allotted for the space that we thought they would take, and I'd completely forgotten that weeks and weeks ago I had pulled all the Roman history out of there. So that space no longer fits history. And I have not even bothered to, to try to see how much the Roman books go over it by bringing them out here and putting them on those shelves. But uh, while we were doing that, 
Uh, David was mocking me and and spitting upon my collection because there's very little in the way of big the big fat World War II books that he loves so much, and I love them too. And so when I was out in the sale lot, when I was out in the bargain lot, and the books weren't costing you know anything but a notion of money, I decided that I would if if there were any out there that were obvious buys, I would get them as things that I've had in the past but somehow don't have now. And I found two of them. I found uh, Andrew Roberts' book Storm of War which is incredibly readable. Actually, the two people that I found today are incredibly readable historians. This is just rocket speed that you'll go through it. Uh, just uh, uh, It's a big one-volume history of the war, so you know it's going to leave out more than it includes, but uh, he's a tremendously readable author. Any of you who have ever taken my, my uh, recommendations about him will know that. Uh, and then the other one, also a very readable author. This author, unfortunately, is no longer alive. But this is Stanley Weintraub, who uh, was a popular historian and biographer. I just loved him. I love everything he did. And I've often had this book, but uh, I didn't have it. As soon as I saw it this morning, I realized I didn't have it. This is Long Day's Journey into War. Uh, his history of the months and weeks and personalities leading up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And the, the cha that changed the entire fate of World War II because it brought the United States into the war. Uh, this is a, a big, thick thing. It reads wonderfully, just like uh, Andy Roberts. It just reads wonderfully. Well, well, uh, time for a reread of this. I haven't, I read this when it first came out. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, goodness. This has, uh, this has the pub sheet information. Might as well be in a mail hall. This isn't me, is it? Oh, it's got, it's got, uh, dog-eared pages as well, and exactly the way the reviewer would do. No, it's not me. Okay. So another reviewer did it, and also <laughs> went through it the exact same way. Look at this. Like, I can, I know they won't mark the pages, because that takes more effort, and book reviewers are very lazy, but there are pages turned down. I know that the, that if this, this was a book reviewer who got this, because they got the pub sheet, and I know that if they got the pub sheet, that they used the pub sheet as a bookmark. Which means the pages that are turned down periodically through here are the things the book reviewer is uh, wants to go back to, to copy them out and maybe use them in the review. <laughs> That's interesting. I'll, I'll have to try and figure out who had this. It's not a large candidate pool. Uh, this came out in 1991. I read it then. I think I've read it once since then. So very glad to have it. Two big World War II books to decrease the load of mockery. Uh, so what do we got here? This is from Dutton News. <laughs> oh, goodness. On heavy, buttery paper. Also, someone uh, photocopied the publicist. Uh, the publicist for the book. Uh, photocopied the reviews from Publishers Weekly and Library Journal. And Kirkus. Wow. Well, I guess that would make sense, right? They would, they would do that because you don't have the internet. So if you want the reviewer to know that the library, that the, the three trade journals have all loved it, uh, you have to do this. Huh. Okay. All right. So you've got the pub sheet and that. And then what else? There's another paper here. Oh, the biography of Stanley Weintraub. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I don't actually need any of that. I'm just going to be reading it with pleasure. How much fun is that? <laughs> so uh, then I found a delight. This is an absolute delight. Uh, this is H.R.F. Keating, and this is the bedside companion to crime. Not a long thing. And let me show you the author's inimitable face. There he is. Uh, he was the, the head of the detection club uh, forever and ever, a beloved figure in, in the legendary detective club. And he also wrote uh, a series of murder mysteries set in colonial Bombay, starring Inspector Gote. And I have... Every time I read nonfiction by him, he did a lot of writing about murder mysteries and crime fiction, and he's delightful, utterly delightful to read on those subjects. And every time I read him on those subjects, I always feel like going back to the Gote books and trying to like them better. I they just I didn't dislike them. They just left me just completely uninterested. But how is it possible that someone could be so... He was sparkling in conversation. He was also... He's wonderful on the page when he's writing in his own voice, nonfiction. How is it possible that I can go away when he's writing fiction? It must be there, and I just have not seen it. This is just a little collection of mystery odds and ends. Uh, just little mis mystery essays and thoughts and whatnot. Uh, delightful. I've known about it. I've seen it in libraries. Never had it before. It will go on the mystery shelf once there is a mystery shelf. 
once I have organized the books in the little book room, or maybe at least take an account of what's going in there and what's not, even if I don't organize them. <sighs> David left too early. That's the problem here. But the last thing I got, <laughs> the last thing I got was totally unexpected. And I mean totally. You could say, you know, you don't know, you know what you're going to get in the, saddle, in the Brattle sale lot. So you could say that a lot of these books were unexpected, but they weren't totally unexpected because you're only going to get books in the Brattle sale lot. Uh, but I, today, for a dollar piece, I found a treasure trove, something I was not expecting at all. I found a pile of old Tarzan comic books <laughs> from when DC Comics had the franchise to Tarzan. They had it for a long time, and it was mostly glorious uh, because they handed it over to the uh, writer and artist Joe Kubert for the main Tarzan feature. There were backup features with Korak or uh, even John Carter of Mars, but they hand, they gave the franchise of Tarzan to Joe Kubert, and he immediately, in his efforts on Tarzan, became one of the Tarzan Immortals. Which is, you know, that's kind of amazing. Russ Manning, Hal Foster, Bernie Hogarth, uh, Joe Kubert. He, he earned his place in that roster of great Tarzan artists, perhaps the greatest Tarzan artist. Uh, and he did it for a long time for for DC Comics. And I had all these issues. I bought them. I'm a huge Edgar Rice Burroughs fan, so I bought them when they were coming out. I was a big fan of DC Comics anyway. I want to show you these. I didn't get them all. There were a bunch of Tarzan comics there. These are they're very moldy, atmosphere, uh, attic smell to them. And they also are warped in a way that can be fixed. All I need to do is take uh, the Oxford Dictionary of Military History, the Oxford Dictionary of Edwardian Literature, the Oxford Dictionary of American Literature, the Oxford D Dictionary of English Literature, Chambers Biographical Dictionary. I need to build a pile about four feet tall of 10-pound books. Put these underneath them and forget about them for a week. When I'm done, they won't be warped anymore. <laughs> uh, but I want to show you these for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I'll give you a hint of uh, Kubert's artwork. It's just incredible. Just just amazingly beautiful. Uh, and, the, and these are all in the, the original, uh, you know, paperback colorings and like this. His Tarzan is so assured. Just so incredibly assured. It's just amazing. Uh, uh, but I want to show you them mainly for the covers. Because these covers are amazing. They, they are amazing. And uh, they tee me up on a diatribe that I want to give you when I'm done. Here's another one. I got... There were a whole bunch of, of uh, Tarzan issues there. I got all the ones that had Joe Kubert covers. Uh, irrespective of whether or not they had Joe Kubert interior artwork. Most of them do. Uh, but I didn't care. I, this is, look at that, Tarzan and the Jewels of Opera. There is La, the mistress of Opar. Uh, we have, uh, periodically at this time, DC Comics, not just for Tarzan, but for a lot of their comics, would give you, uh, in the course of a year's subscription, they would give you giant 100-page issues. Uh, they did this for Tarzan as well. Here you get the main story with artwork by Kubert, but you also get backups from older stuff. Uh, including uh, Russ Manning doing um, Korak, I believe. Yeah, yeah, you get uh, you get great Russ Manning artwork as well. You get the, the best of both worlds here, and then another hundred page Tarzan thing. Uh, these hundred pages were just great. I got as many of them as I could for Superman, Superboy, uh, Batman, even uh, and Tarzan. I love them. Look at this Tarzan versus. A mummy, a stone mummy, isn't that awesome? That is just so incredible. Here we have another, uh, another giant-sized issue. But you notice that DC Comics not only did they take, did they knock the price down, knock sixty cents to fifty cents, but they stopped calling it one hundred page giant. It's just a giant. It's still square bound, but it's just a giant. And I believe this is a lot of Russ Manning. Yeah. Oh, this might be all Russ Manning. It is. In fact, this is all Russ Manning. All, all of Russ Manning's great Pellucidar stuff. Let me have a look at that. Look at this cover. Just incredible. <laughs> I think by this point, uh, Kubert was not doing the artwork anymore. And I'm not sure that they will credit who is doing it. I'm not sure that they'll, that they'll tell me who it is. Uh, Reyes? Is that right? See, it's very good artwork, but it's not, uh, it's not 
Kubert anymore. Although he kept doing the covers, and so I kept getting them. And I just, these were all really cheap. Look at this. Tarzan and the Incas. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Here's a, uh, these are just classic covers. They, I don't know, I'm not probably doing them justice, but they are amazingly composed. Here, of course, this, a certain movie was really big in the theaters when this was out in the 70s, so they, they, had to, they had to jump right in. Here's another one, Tarzan rescuing a little, a little albino gorilla. Uh, another one, a Tarzan on a biplane. Look at that. Look at that. Just incredible. Uh, Tarzan and uh, hyenas. I won't, I won't belabor things with, uh, you know, sites of these with uh, what exactly is going on here. But a lot is going on. Kubert knew how to compose a cover. He knew where your eye was going to look first, second, and third. And these all show that. They all show that. Look at these. They're just amazing. They're just amazing. Uh, <laughs> there's this one. Uh, this, is, uh, this cover shows what BookTube feels like when Steve uploads six videos. <laughs> Look at the gigantic tongue coming out of there. <laughs> Just incredible. Uh, and then finally this. Now, by the time we got here to this, this is Tarzan number uh, 249. By the time we got here, you can see it's it's not uh, Joe Kubert, and it's also not as good. It's it, it, DC had the franchise, so they were, uh, you know, they were just going to keep using it, but... Uh, the, the artwork's not, it's not as good. They are still Tarzan adventures. Uh, and that's plenty for me. And the diatribe here, uh, as I put these back in order, the diatribe here is uh, how poorly these things are serviced by uh, for posterity. For you, the reader, now. If you were born in the 21st century, you've never seen these things. Unless you happen to walk into a comic book shop that's selling these moldy old copies for a dollar a piece, then you've never seen them. Uh, there's been scarcely any reprinting of the Kubert era of Tarzan, much less any of the others. There was a very small print collection of the Russ Manning Korak Son of Tarzan, probably 10 years ago. I reviewed it, uh, but it's collectible now. And when we're talking about collectible stuff like this, we on Epic Comic Book Wednesday, we talk about the Marvel's Epic Collections. And DC is coming up with things like that. I realize that franchise comics are harder to deal with. They're a harder needle to thread. Who owns these? Who owns this issue? The rights to what's in here. This is all great uh, Joe Kubert artwork. Who owns it? Uh, and you know, look at this. This is just that is just awesome. That is incredible. Who owns that artwork? And where is it? Who has the right to make a big, fat, omnibus edition of it? Or even a really nice paperback, a, big, a Marvel epic collection paperback of the Joe Kubert Tarzan. I would buy that. Uh, it's these old issues that just... I, I got them, of course, because I want to reread them. I haven't read them since the 70s. But I, I also it also bothers me in an archival kind of way that these are considered ephemera. And that no one's taking any trouble to preserve them. In an ideal world... I, I know we don't live in, any, in an ideal world. In an ideal world, if, if what I would do here, take off all the DC livery, take off the return of, lowercase this thing, but keep the type font there. Get rid of, of course, all of the indicia of the price of the year or whatnot, and things like this. But keep the illustration. Where is the master copy of this illustration? Who owns the, abs the actual illustration of this cover? Did anybody even bother to preserve it? Is it hanging on somebody's wall somewhere? What I would want in an ideal world would be for Edgar Rice Burroughs Incorporated to come out with mass market paperbacks of all of Tarzan and give them these covers. S preserve these Joe Kubert covers. These amazing covers. I mean, why shouldn't this be the current cover of Tarzan and the Jewels of Opar? No offense to Joe Jusco, but you're no Joe Kubert. Why shouldn't this be the cover of that? You could... You could maybe use, you know, computer enhancement to make it, the flesh tones look a little bit better, make things look a little bit less comic booky. But the, these these illustrations are better. Uh, <laughs> or, or Tarzan and Pellucidar, for Pete's sake. I would do that. If I had my way, I would do that. I would preserve these things somehow and immortalize them. If not on the cover of current Tarzan paperbacks, which really they ought to be. 
it's a shame that they're being wasted. It's a shame that no one sees this artwork. Uh, if not that, then certainly a collection, a collected volume of some kind or other, of Hubert's covers and interior art. Or, if you don't want to get all picky about that, then just do a big omnibus edition or two of the DC run on Tarzan in its totality. Everybody. Not just Kubert, but everybody. <sighs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, that was my uh, my Brattle Hall. Uh, it ended with, the, with this great Tarzan, I hate to say it, but it is the way it's viewed, ephemera. It ended with Tarzan ephemera that I'm going to spend a wonderful hour on. I'm going to have to... These obviously came from somebody's attic. They smell it. They're warped. They were obviously sitting under something. And they've got that light patina of, of dust on them. So I'm going I'm to need to figure out a way to clean these things. I'm not 100% sure how to clean a comic book. But I'm going to try. I'm going to figure out a way to do that. Uh, and then just reread them. Just reread the whole bunch of them. Plus a whole bunch of these other things. I don't know that I'll reread a James M. Cain tonight. But this thing, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, without a doubt. Uh, so there you go. That was a Brattle haul. I went back to the Brattle bookshop despite having got over 100 books last week. <laughs> but I wouldn't have turned any of these things down no matter when I'd seen them. <laughs> so, so, anyway, And rain is coming. Surely that's excuse enough. <laughs> My only real excuse is that you would do the same. <laughs> so, don't you get too high up on your high horse with me. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Book